Welcome to a new IPOP webinar on genetic testing. Thank you all for taking the time to join this meeting. I am Martin Bergeon, IPOP president, and it is my pleasure to moderate this webinar. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to thank Grifold for making this webinar possible. With the advent of new genetic testing with application to the field of PID, more defects in genes responsible for PID are discovered every year. Today, we would like to explore the modalities of genetic testing and how it does benefit patient care. To discuss this topic, we have invited Dr. Pamela Lee. You are most welcome, Doctor. Dr. Lee, you are a clinical associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics and Adolescent Medicine, Lee ka Shing Faculty of Medicine, the University of Hong Kong. You are also honorary consultant, Department of Pediatrics and Adolescent Medicine at the Queen Mary Hospital, Hong Kong. You receive training in the Great Ormond Street Hospital for Triagen, London, and you are currently appointed as honorary consultant for the HICT service at the Hong Kong Children's Hospital and the HQ, uh, um, excuse me, HQU uh, Shenzhen Hospital. You are a lead organizer for a series of summer schools for the Asia Pacific Society for Primary Immunodeficiency, APSID, and the Viva Asia Blood and Marathon Plant Consortium since 2015 and 2017, respectively. You are the medical advisor for PID League, a PID advocacy group established in Hong Kong since 2015. Welcome, Dr. Lee. So, how will this webinar work? Dr. Lee will soon begin her presentation. When the presentation begins, you can post your question in the question tab. You can see uh, on the right side of your webinar screen. After the, the presentation, we will discuss a selection of questions with both Dr. Lee and with Dr. Virgil Dan, an internist clinical immunologist in the Primary Immunodeficiency Center at Erasmus MC Rotterdam, the Netherlands, and who is a member of IPOP Medical Advisory Panel. Welcome, Dr. Dan. Dr. Dan will also answer some of your questions in written form in the Q&A sec section of this webinar. And thank you for joining this webinar today. With introductions and explanation, Dan, then let's get started. Dr. Lee, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Martin, for your very kind introduction. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to join this webinar from wherever you are. And so um, I'm really a great pleasure for me um, to accept this very kind invitation from IPOPI um, to share with you this very important topic, genetic testing for PIDs. As Martin has mentioned, really many new advances have been made in the past decade or so that made genetics testing widely available um, for many patients right now and has really made a difference, really made life-changing difference to the management. So here it shows that the latest version of the International Union of Immunological Societies, the IUIS classification of primary immunodeficiencies. So as you can see, so um, for the latest one in 2019, now we have more than 400 different um, immunological diseases being described with more than 430 non-genetic defects being discovered. And you can see the steep slope of the increase in the number of genetic defects being identified thanks to the advances in genetics testing that has made this possible. So on the right side, you can see a colorful bar showing the number of diseases in each categories of PIDs being described. So well, the word primary immunodeficiencies suggests that there are deficiencies in our immune system. Um, so most of us will understand PIDs um, would lead to susceptibility of infections, but actually even more important and even more commonly, patients have a wide presentation, wide spectrum of presentations, including inflammation, autoimmunity, allergy, and malignancy. 
So these uh, might not necessarily be related to a deficient immune system, but actually these are related to a dysregulated immune response. So indeed, in the latest version of the IUI's classification, we now call PIDs as inborn errors of immunity, IEI, because that would encompass problems of our immune system, not just as a result of deficiency, but actually a dysfunctional or dysregulated immune response. So as for diagnostic approach, we have patients presenting to the doctors for clinical evaluations based on the history of presenting illness, based on family history, and, and also physical examination findings. So if there is a suspicion of IEI or PIDs, okay, so the doctor will decide whether genetic investigation is required. Often, more importantly, some basic immunological workup will be done because that will be a very important guide as to which genetic test modality is the most appropriate. So um, once that is decided, so a lab which is suitable um, to perform the genetic test will be chosen and the patient specimen will be sent to the lab for carrying out the genetic test and for analysis. So once that result is available, so the doctor or the investigation team will decide whether any additional follow-up investigations is required, especially when the genetic mutation identified um, has an uncertain functional role or it might actually be a novel gene so that further functional investigation may be required to characterize the pathogenicity, whether the gene mutation is able to explain the diagnosis of the patient. So once a diagnosis is made, so the doctors have gathered all the necessary information, will come back to the patient. So to explain the diagnosis to the patient and also the family, to make use of the genetic information to guide management and treatment and lead to a clinical benefit, not just to the patient, but also to the families in terms of carrier screening, prenatal diagnosis and counseling and family planning. So really there's been much advances in the clinical diagnostic and also treatment, treatment approach to IEI. So um, this is an excellent review um, just published earlier this year by um, Gigi Notarangelo, which um, um, whom many of you know very well. Previously, as I've mentioned, we know PIDs as a group of diseases predisposing to infections. But nowadays, we know that it is not just um, predisposing to a broad range of pathogens, just like what we see in SCID, in chronic granulomatous disease, they were susceptible to a wide range of bacteria or fungal, but actually some patients may just be susceptible to a very narrow group of pathogens, for example, mycobacteria, as in the Mendelian susceptibility to mycobacterial diseases, MSMDs. Or some patients would be susceptible to hyperinflammation or autoimmunity as a characteristic rather than just infections. And um, previously, we thought um, the pathophysiology, the mechanism of disease, is due to blood cells, problems in the blood cells from a bone marrow. But now, um, with more understanding about immunology, about immunity, we know that the immune system interacts with a lot of extra hematopoietic system, that is our intrinsic immunity, like our lungs, the gut, the microbiota, to manifest the disease. So uh, the manifestation, the presentation, may not just be completely arising from the immune system, but the interaction with many other organs. So previously, we thought PIDs, uh, the diagnosis is based on clinical and immunological abnormalities. But now we know that um, one gene can lead to many phenotypes. We call that allelic heterogeneity, which is a rather complex term, but it means that um, mutation of one gene, even within the same family, they can have many different phenotypes. That is the clinical presentation. So individuals, each one of us are unique, even if we carry the same mutation, even if we have problems with the same genes. Or on the other hand, many different genes can present with the same phenotype. As the example I've mentioned, the Mendelian susceptibility of mycobacterial diseases, many genes can manifest as 
one problem, okay, like susceptibility to PCG, for example. So this is called locus heterogeneity. So finally, um, previously we thought um, the treatment is based on supportive prophylactic antimicrobials. We give IVIG to replace what is deficient. But nowadays, we know that many other treatment modalities are available. Okay, so and it can be very specific as well. Okay, so now first, okay, I come to the first concept of um, the um, specific. Okay, so um, here you can see that um, one example of defects in intrinsic and innate immunity. So um, you can see that many different genes are collected under the category of MSMD. So all the mutations of all these genes will predispose patients to problems with mycobacterial infections, mainly BCG, that is non-tuberculous mycobacteria, and also the environmental mycobacteria, and some of them with TB as well. So there is a genetic um, basis for all these mycobacterial infections. So same for human papilloma virus, um, human simplex enterovirus, and some other viruses like influenza, vaccine strain, which are really very weak strain, of um, the vaccine um, um, antigens, that is the measles and also varicella. These are live vaccines. Familial chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis and um, also the toll-like receptor pathway. So now with more understanding, we are able to recognize all these unusual infections with a genetic basis. So another concept I'd like to share is that um, the gene mutations um, even with one single gene, they can have different pattern of inheritance. So for example, the interferon gamma receptor 1, so um, they can be inherited in autosomal recessive or autosomal dominant manner. And um, these um, mutations can also lead to various expression of the protein. So some would have a complete absence of the protein expression. So some would have residual protein expression and therefore with residual function. Or on the contrary, they may have too much protein expression that will actually have um, negative effects on the function of the protein. And so this concept um, tells us it is so important to understand the outcome or the impact of the mutation. It is not good enough just to know about the mutation because when you know the location of the mutation and also the functional impact then you'll be able to deduce the cellular phenotype and ultimately the function at the tissue level and then you will be able to explain um, the immune dysfunction and therefore lead to um, specific treatment of the patient that is individualized. So here the, um, this table and also the various inheritance pattern, um, whether the gene defect would lead to a complete or partial defect and whether the protein is expressed or not, is a very fine illustration of the concept of one gene, many phenotypes, and also all these different genes all constituting to MSMD is a fine illustration of the concept of many genes but one phenotype. So finally, another major advance, as I've mentioned, is about treatment. So um, many PIDs are now amenable to treatment by transplant, but with the genetic defects being identified, we are able to offer gene therapy to the patients and also precision medicine targeted at the biochemical and cellular defects, for example, biologics, okay? So um, if the patient has got um, and overproduction of certain cytokines, then we can use cytokine blockade, okay? Or we know exactly where the molecular defect is, okay? So we can target those molecular defects. And so this is why knowing the genetic defect is so important. And this um, illustrates the timeline of the development of cell therapy, gene therapy, and also pharmacological treatment. So gene therapy, um, there is really very much rapid advances and now an increasing number of PIDs are able to be treated with gene therapy. But on the provision that we know what genetic defect is and therefore this is why genetic testing is so important. 
and pharmacological treatment. So you can see the rapid increase in usage of um, targeted treatment, biologics, the jacanips, the inhibitors, that again is based on a fine understanding, a thorough understanding of the molecular defects. So how does genetic testing benefit patient care? So apart from offering definitive diagnosis, it guides the treatment, it provides the prognosis, okay? Knowing the genetic mutation, we know um, say whether the protein dysfunction is complete or is completely absent, and that has an important bearing on the prognosis. Recurrence risk in the, in the family, so um, you identify the genetic mutation in the index case, you are able to screen other family members. And it helps a lot for prenatal diagnosis as well as to um, whether the fetus is affected. And in some families, we will be able to offer pre-implantation genetic diagnosis after detailed counseling. And therefore, genetic testing benefit patient care by providing important tools for enhanced decision making. So it is important that we carry out genetic testing with a target goal, okay? We know very well what's in our mind and what we want to offer and what the patient would like to achieve. And most importantly, it helps the clinicians for decision making. So um, some of you may have heard about the term of next generation sequencing. So um, this is something that we are going to discuss today. It has led to genetic diagnosis in 25 to 60% of the patients being tested, but still many patients remain without a genetic explanation for the symptoms. Um, but don't be discouraged by this because patients with symptoms and also lab findings suggestive of immunodeficiency, we can still treat them accordingly based on the clinical presentation, physical examination findings, imaging, immunological investigations and pathology so um, we can treat um, these patients according to this very useful information. So a negative genetic testing doesn't mean that we need to wait until a definitive diagnosis can be located. So this provides the timeline of the development of um, various genetic modalities and test techniques. In the, 1990, in the 1980s, PCR, the polymerase chain reaction, so the first very important tool for genetic testing is being discovered and also put into clinical use. And then later with the Human Genome Project, that is really the basis for us to go for whole exome and also whole genome sequencing because you need to know about the genome before you can do that. So these also provide the basis for the different techniques like Sanger sequencing, which is the like, targeted gene sequencing, comparative genomic hybridization, use of gene panels, exome, and also genome sequencing. So as we go, you can see that the ease of analysis go down, but the amount of the genomic data per run goes up. So the challenge right now is not limited by the technique, but it is um, sort of, we need to catch up with how to um, analyze the huge amount of genomic data that is generated from these um, um, techni techniques, which are very useful, which contains a lot of resources and will potentially be able to explain the patient's phenotype much better and therefore help clinicians to do better decisions. So now, Sanger sequencing, okay? So it is easy to understand because it is a targeted sequencing. We use that when um, the clinician is able to um, think of a PID in which a diagnosis is clinically recognized, okay? So for example, a boy coming in with recurrent um, sinus infections, chest infections, and you check that there is absent IgGAM, okay? And you found that there's no B cells. So the first impression would be x linked a gamma globulinemia, SLA. So many a time the clinician will just go straight to test for the BTK, okay? And um, for example, an infant coming in with bleeding, okay, with low platelets, with small platelets, okay, with eczema. So the first diagnosis coming to our mind would be Wiscott Eldridge syndrome. So this is a very reliable and cost-effective method to assess family members of an affected patient with a known mutation. It's just like, okay, so it's Christmas time, you want to buy a gift, okay, you have something in your mind, and so you go to a specialty shop and just buy the gift. Okay, but 
if um, you want to buy a special gift for your friend, but if you don't have any specific thing in your mind, you go to the department store. There are many things, okay, um, you can buy from a department store, okay, but you need to spend that time, okay, to go around to find something which you think is the best for your friend, okay? So this is an analogy for next generation sequencing. So um, this is a high throughput, uh, massively parallel DNA sequencing platforms where you will sequence all the exons, okay, or the even the entire genome, which is like a department store, at one go, okay. So it is very informative, okay. So um, but it really takes time, okay. So if you have something in your mind, you go to a specialty shop, you can get it very quickly because you ha already have something in your mind. But if you go to a department store, you need to spend that time and also effort in order to find something you need. So this includes the whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing, gene panels, and also the transcriptome by uh, the RNA seq technique. So this is the comparison. So for the targeted gene panel, okay, so you would have um, a list of genes to be captured. So for the whole exome sequencing, it also involves the capturing of the exons. And therefore, it depends on our understanding of the known exons. But some of the exons which has not been discovered may not be captured by this technique. And so for the whole genome sequencing, it is really hypothesis free, so there is no capture. And so you would really sequence the entire genome. So in terms of the turnaround time, so for the single gene testing, because it's so specific, so for labs which are experienced, they can do it within days, okay? So even within one to two days, okay? So this is actually the most straightforward way to do the sequencing. So if you get it right, bingo, okay? So it has um, to depend on the pretest probability. So for the disease targeted NGS, that is for the gene panel, okay? So um, it depends on the um, sort of presentation. So if the patient has got, um, for example, an impaired um, oxidative burst, okay? So the diagnosis is very likely to be chronic granulomatous disease. It can be X-linked, it can be autosomal recessive. So you would go for a CGD gene panel, for example. Or if the patient has got an absent tract, okay, no T cells, clinically very compatible with SCID, then you can go for a SCID panel. Or you can go for a PID gene panel containing more than 400 genes um, covering all the PID genes, okay? This is also another way. So, um, but as for whole exome, NGS, okay, it covers 1% of the entire human genome responsible for the synthesized protein. So, um, this would be helpful when you do not really have anything in mind, okay, or the phenotypes are overlapping, it does not really match um, one very specific clinical syndrome that you know of, for example, combined immunodeficiency or CVID. So, if you want to find out the genetic mutation, you may need to rely on whole exome or even whole genome NGS. So the limitation of whole exome sequencing is that we may miss large deletions and also duplications. So you may need whole genome NGS in order to overcome that difficulty. But the timing um, of the turnaround, okay, will need weeks or months, okay, because of the huge amount of information yielded um, from these um, platforms that you will need a lot of bioinformatics analysis in order to find out the pathogenic variants. So I've mentioned about CGH, that is one way to detect structural variants like, micro, uh, like the micro deletions and also duplications. So how it works is really a ratio game, okay? So um, the green and the red, okay, the green represent the patient and the red represent the control. If they are in one-to-one -one sort of ratio, so it will kind of indicate it um, as a yellow. But if there is a difference in the ratio, like um, the patient has got a duplication, so more copies than the control, it will emit as an, another signal illustrated as green here. Or if the patient has got less copies than the control, and then there will be a disbalance of the ratio and it will emit as an another color, like the red here. So it is really a comparison of the different signals that um, would indicate um, the disbalance in the gene copies and therefore indicates the likelihood of duplications or deletions. As for diagnostic potentials, so the single gene or the gene panel varies. It depends on the phenotype and also the patient um, 
um, um, background, okay, that is the pretest probability, the likelihood of finding a detectable genetic cause. So for the whole exome sequencing, so if we test the patient only, that is the proband, that will be roughly around 30%. But if we do the trio base, including the parents, the chance of finding a de novo, excitating a de novo mutation, the chance will be higher. And this is also why sometimes a doctor would invite the parents to come, okay, if the child is a proband, okay? For whole genome sequencing, the chance to find the uh, pathogenic variant will be even higher because it, ha it has a higher coverage of the entire genome. So um, the categorization of the variants. So what happens after the results um, is out, okay? So um, the um, report we state likely pathogenic or very highly likely to be pathogenic, that is 100%, or it is likely to be benign or likely benign. But what's um, creating a headache is a variant of unknown significance, BUS, okay? So how to decide that? It is based on the collected population data, okay? So what we call the minor allele frequency, based on our understanding of the functional and biological data, the variant-based computational data that is about informatics, and we also take into other factors into consideration like the phenotype, the family history, and also alternative cause. So this will take um, a lot of effort in providing the genetic counseling as to the implication of the variant being identified. So take an example. This is a lovely uh, paper just recently published um, describing more than 800 patients with suspected primary immunodeficiencies using targeted panel versus whole exome sequencing. So here, um, it covers 878 patients from 28 countries in the past decade um, with a wide range of age for the median is four years, mostly children, 60% being male, and then a high consanguinity rate of 63%, okay? So um, these are all the distributions of the mutation type and also the disease-causing variant. But I'd like to point out the diagnostic yield. It is higher when um, the test is being performed in pediatrics because if anything manifests in the pediatric age, the genetic loading is higher. And also the chance of success in identifying a pathogenic mutation is higher in the consanguineous population as well. And it is also easier to find a genetic mutation for the patient's hypogammaglobulinemia and also severe infections, but less so in autoimmunity and also malignancy because it is likely that the environmental contribution is higher and not just genetic in these conditions. And also more importantly, you can see that for patients who committed to do the targeted NGS panel first, the diagnostic yield is 56%. So for those who have negative targeted NGS panel proceeding to whole exome sequencing, an additional 70% of the patient will be able to get a diagnosis. So for the overall diagnostic yield is 58%. So um, for some patients who go directly to whole exome sequencing, the diagnostic yield is actually not low, okay? So it's 46%. So altogether, you would be able to find a genetic diagnosis for roughly around 50 to 60%. So what is the economic consideration? So here it did quite some calculations. So based on a diagnostic yield of 56%, if you go straight to whole exome sequencing, you can actually save money rather than to go for a tiered approach first with the NGS and those with negative, you go for whole exome. So you can actually go straight to whole exome sequencing. So um, money can be saved even more for um, populations where the rate of consanguinity is lower, okay? So because the chance of having a identified a genetic mutation is lower, so probably you would just go for a whole exome sequencing rather than tiered approach. This has an important implication for clinicians to choose whether to go for a targeted gene panel or to go straight to whole exome sequencing. And it's something for us to consider, especially when whole exome sequencing might not be covered by insurance, okay? So this is something that we should advocate for patients. So this is the summary of um, what I'd like to share with you today. So for the clinical assessment, it always comes first as to the decision of whether to go for genetic testing 
and whether to go for a targeted gene or a gene panel or the NGS-based genetic testing. So we need to select the best test and also the most appropriate test for the patients and then making use of the information to um, inform us um, the management and also to inform us of the best practice. And very importantly, it will help scientists to make new discoveries and understanding about PIDs. Thank you very much for your attention and I welcome any questions from you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee, for this clear and enlightening presentation with many learning points. Now let's have some questions and I can see that we have in the, in, in the tab. And, um, and thank you, uh, Dr. Dan, for joining uh, to uh, this uh, question session. So I will maybe first take some general question about, um, for, for example, one from Jody Drabwell. At what stage do you provide genetic counseling? I'm sorry, would you mind repeating? No, no, sorry. At what stage uh, do, do you provide genetic uh, counseling? Okay, um, thank you very much. Yeah, so um, I would say um, genetic counseling, um, it really, um, we can take into consideration of the family history, okay? So we may be able to catch the possibility of inheritance by a very good family history, even from the first encounter. So an X-linked sort of inheritance um, where the male um, family members are being affected is something often quite apparent just by a family history. So we can already have that initial suspicion. Um, but for the definitive genetic counseling, we often do that when we get hold of the genetic um, finding. And also um, it depends on our initial approach for example, we've already taken the trio um, our family members, okay? Um, that is one thing that perhaps, okay, once the reports come back, we already know about the carrier status, okay? Or sometimes we do the cascade screening that we identify the mutation from the proband, that is from the patient who present with the symptoms, and we do cascade screening for the remaining family members. So um, I would say in those kind of situations, Families um, counseling or genetic counseling would um, take place in stages, depending on the number of family members being identified. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dan. Do you want to to add something or tell me? <laughs> no, I have nothing uh, new to add. Uh, fully agree. Um, how is the access to genetic uh, diagnosis globally? Do you have an idea mm -hmm. about the availability and especially uh, developed country? Yes, um, this vary a lot, okay? So, for example, in Hong Kong, only in the past two, three years that um, the government system, the public health care system, has started to take up genetic testing. So, previously, for example, in PIDs, it relies a lot from research labs that perform genetic testing on a research basis. And because of that, um, it is often available free to the patients because it is either supported by research funding or from donations. So um, I know in some countries, um, um, the patients would need to um, sort of um, initiate genetic testing for themselves, okay? So because um, the doctors may not be um, very knowledgeable about PIDs, but the patients actually know something wrong about themselves and they learn about their diseases from online resources. And then I've heard many stories that they actually initiated genetic testing for themselves. So the next generation sequencing is a blessing for them because they do not necessarily need to know which PID, but they felt something is wrong about the immune system. So they sent off their bloods to this commercial company asking for a PID panel and then they actually bring the genetic report to see a doctor. Yeah. So this is actually one way that some countries is operating. And so in other countries, which I know, okay, genetic testing may not be reimbursed, okay? Yeah. Or if, even if this is available, uh, if, uh, even if, uh, well, it may not be com uh, com uh, available in those countries. And so they may need to be sent overseas, okay? Or they may need to rely on some um, charity to support the genetic testing from the developing countries. So I would say really there are a lot of variation in practices and lots of unmet needs. Okay, and uh, in your experience, both of you, are there uh, only common concerns that a patient raised before a genetic test? Um, common concerns, okay, is firstly, 
when the result will be available. Okay, so um, this is why I talked about the turnaround time. So um, in terms of the anticipation, so some disease conditions, definitely they need urgent diagnosis. For example, skid, okay? But skid, well, okay, if a patient has no tract, no T cells, um, the phenotypity is compatible. So the decision of going into transplant does not rely on the genetic confirmation, okay? The doctor will just go ahead and wait for the genetic diagnosis later. But still, okay, I'm not saying that genetic diagnosis is not important for skid because if we know that this is a patient with Artemis deficiency, with VDJ recombination problem, it has an important implication on the conditioning regimen, okay? Um, on the implication of whether we should avoid the um, alkylating agents and also to avoid irradiation. So um, all these have important bearing, okay, as to the choice. And so the timing is one, the accuracy, okay, and whether a negative result really means negative or whether a negative result means that we should proceed to further testing and also what with the implication for the family members, the reproduction plans, okay, all these would be what the families um, are concerned about. Mm -hmm. And you, in your part of the world, uh, Dr. Dan? Yeah. Yes, uh, so what we experience also in our clinical practice that if you uh, talk about uh, genetic uh, testing in patients, they also have the concern. So if you find some genetic variants, what is the clinical implication of that? Because we also know that we find some genetic variants if we test those patients and those genetic variants may not all have uh, clinical significance. So that's also what patients, if you give back the results and you say, well, we have found some genetic variants of indeed what was uh, called uh, variants of unknown significance, it also raises concerns for the patients because they have the feeling, I have some genetic defects, but the doctor cannot explain what this means. So that's also, it is very important to discuss with the patients that some genetic variants may have no, or at current, no clinical implications. It's something really to take into account indeed. Okay, maybe now a more specific uh, question. Uh, one from Risky Amalia. After knowing the mutation in our patient by genetic testing, should we do functional analy analysis to prove it as the uh, etiology? Hello. Hello, Risky. Hello. Um, nice to see you here. <laughs> so we've met one another um, previously um, in the EPSITS. And so, um, well, thank you very much for the very good question. So it depends on um, several things, okay? So if we find a mutation, if um, it is previously reported in patients, okay? So, um, well, and if the phenotype is compatible, we'll be able to commit that it is a pathogenic variant, okay? And so um, the second scenario is if it is not reported, but it is um, a mutation that is predictive of a null mutation, for example, a nonsense mutation that is a premature termination of the transcription, or if it is a frame shift mutation that is often um, resulting um, in a premature termination or um, um, the protein basically cannot be expressed, okay? This is also pathogenic. So this would be the situations where you may not necessarily need to proceed to functional testing or expression. So for expression, you can do it in different ways. Well, for example, flow cytometry to look at whether the cell expressed the protein, or we can do Western blots, okay, or immunoblotting. This is one way to show the expression. So if there is no protein expression, the protein is not there, okay, so um, we will um, be um, a little bit more confident to say that, okay, this can, okay, um, sort of explain the disease phenotype. Okay, so um, the tricky bit would be mistense mutation. Okay, so um, we need to find out whether the mutation would lead to a problem of the protein function in specific domains, binding with other protein partners, or the protein folding so that it cannot perform the um, normal function. So with that, we may need inputs from structural biologists, from um, tools that we can predict the quaternary structure, or even other more sophisticated immunological investigation to confirm. So sometimes even with all these, we may, may not be able to um, commit the pathogenicity. And this is exactly what Dr. Dam has mentioned, the variance of unknown significance. So um, sometimes we may not be able to have that answer, 
but scientists are always very um, have a lot of perseverance. Okay, so if they have this question in mind, so very often they will try as far as hard as possible to sort this out. Thank you so much. Another question from Ekaterini uh, Guduris. Would you talk a bit more about the role of microarray chromosome test in EI, uh, in IEA? Uh, IEI. IEI. Right. Okay. So, yeah, microarray. Okay. So, yeah. um, this is what um, geneticists often use, okay, especially for syndromal disorders. Okay. Um, so, um, duplications, deletions, and chromosomal rearrangements, okay, would be something that microarray would be able to help. In a way, this is also um, a whole genome sort of um, technique, okay? It is uh, looking at something grossly, okay? Rather than looking at individual genes, it look at regions, okay? Where the genetics, the gene segments are duplicated or being deleted. But it may not be able to tell specifically what the genes um, are defective. Okay, so it depends on the sensitivity and also um, the exact technique. Okay, so the MLPA, okay, so um, may be able to point out, pinpoint the exact genes. Okay, but for the array, it will give you an initial impression of the possible deletions and also the duplications. People use the combination of CGH together with whole exome sequencing to increase the sensitivity. So the idea here is um, the geneticist will be able to define what is the best way to find out the mutation. Sometimes we need multiple techniques. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. We have many uh, several questions on, on CVID persons. And uh, for example, one from Jose Drabwell, if a CVID person has been tested and one 40 genes stands out, despite the fact that these patients have other defects, would it be possible to do gene therapy on that one gene? Hello, Josie. So lovely to see you here. And um, thank you for your question. So um, we are really looking into the future and I'm very hopeful that um, in the future we'll be able to solve the big puzzle of CVID. So, um, well, I think um, genetics and understanding of PIDs are increasingly complex. And for um, the condition of CVID, um, I think increasingly we think that it is not necessarily a monogenic defect. It can be a biogenic or even polygenic defect, okay? Which means that the phenotype can be accounted by two genetic defects adding together, okay? It may not just be contributed by problems from one gene, okay? It takes two to tangle, okay? So, um, well, that is perhaps one way to put this, okay? Or multiple genes, okay? You need contributions from different genes to um, sort of um, 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 come up with a particular phenotype or problem. So, um, whereas um, for gene therapy, so um, at least for currently, um, you may only be able to target one genetic defect to correct one, but maybe in the future, okay, so the technology will become so advanced that we can um, target multiple different genes, okay? But um, perhaps it's still not, we are still not there yet, but I'm hopeful in the future we'll be able to cure CVID altogether. Yeah, we have many questions. I will take the, la the two last one. One is from Abderrahman Mundir. What technique would you propose to test the impact of the variant on a protein in vivo? Of the protein in vivo, okay. So um, I think um, your question is really about the functional testing, okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, um, there are several approach, okay. So um, firstly, uh, we can look at pathways, okay? So say if the molecule is involved in a certain signaling pathway, okay? So uh, we can um, put it in a simple way, stimulate the cells and to see whether um, the cell would elicit the response that you are looking for. But it is not just a sort of um, immunological technique, okay, in looking at um, the functional pathway, stimulation and outcome, simple as that. But I would say imaging, okay, is also a very powerful tool to look at exactly where the protein is located because the location of the protein inside the cell it has also a very important implication on the function, okay? So some mutation of protein would actually affect the subcellular localization 
and therefore the function of the protein as well. Okay, there are many, many new techniques, okay, so um, to characterize the functions of the protein nowadays, okay, and um, so the techniques are coming, okay, we cannot measure it all, so some of the very basic ones like flow cytometry, immunoblotting, okay, so um, the molecular targets, um, experiments, um, these are just the basics, okay, but more is coming. Um, Dr. Dan, do you have anything to supplement? No, I think indeed so if, if you have found a genetic variant you uh, in unknown variants or not previously described, you definitely require uh, functional uh, testing. Uh, indeed, using uh, cell cultures, a pathway uh, analysis, and also you have so uh, you have uh, various predict prediction models, right, to uh, 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 predict the let's say pathogenes pathogenicity of the uh, variant. So these could all help in uh well uh, uh evaluating and uh, explaining the uh, genetic variants yeah thank you both uh, the last question will be from josikova is there centers to send the sample from other countries uh, poor countries that do not have these techniques i i know this is a trick question but well <laughs> we, we must uh, the, the globe the, the whole world so I like to to hear you about that. It's not easy. Yeah. So um, um, what I know of, okay. Um, so um, there has been some um, research centers um, um, with special interest in PID genetics. They will be recruiting patients from all over the world, okay, for particular um, research themes, okay. So in those kind of situations, they may be accepting samples, best patient specimen, okay, from overseas, um, often free of charge. Okay, so um, I think many of these um, sort of collaborative network and also research centers, okay, they are doing this, okay. In Asia, um, we have the um, Asia Pacific, um, um, the APID network, okay, so the Asian PID network um, that um, coincidentally, okay, so it's initiated from my university, okay, um, initiated by Professor Lau. So um, over the past 10 years, we have actually accepted more than 2,000 or nearly 3,000 patient referrals, okay, for genetic testing, free of charge. And this is also one way that we get to know about the genetic landscape of PID in Asia, and that help raise um, awareness of PID in many countries, because without diagnosis, this patient will never be able to appear, and also they will not be uncovered to raise the necessary attention by the healthcare providers and therefore the government. So with the genetic testing, um, the needs of the patient uh, will be revealed and therefore we'll be able to close the gap. So um, our mission is really to um, help the developing countries to get genetic testing as much as possible because DNA is something relatively easy to be sent overseas. It's kind of stable. It is difficult to send cells, okay? But DNA is something that you can send overseas. So you have now increasingly more clever ways for example, the DNA can be spotted on the filter paper and you can just mail it like um, any ordinary um, surface mail, okay? So um, those would be the um, cheapest way um, for travel, but of course, um, individual countries will still need to observe the regulatory guidelines into the, uh, uh, in, in sending these genetic materials overseas. But as long as this is registered, it is overcome, following all the regulations, and if you are able to identify an overseas centers who is able to accept these centers, so um, this international collaboration is very, very helpful to facilitate genetic testing, especially for patients from developing countries. Yeah, absolutely. And we also know about the testing, uh, the array testing kit developed by Dr. Suratanoni in Thailand, which we hope will be of help in the region as well. Thank you so much. Uh, we have now reached the end of this webinar, which was made possible thanks a uh, kind donation from Griffiths. On behalf of iPoppy, I would like to say a warm thank you to Dr. Pamela Lee for this excellent presentation and for all the answers you provided. We also thanks Dr. Virgil Dam for uh, your answering. 
uh, question in written and also uh, by or of course uh, thanks again to all of you for attending this uh, ipopi webinar if you have a minute to spare we encourage you to share your feedback on this webinar by pressing the link shared on the screen the link will also be posted in the chat please note that you will be able to see the recording on ipopi tv within a couple of days we encourage you to share it as much as you can to those who you think will benefit from it. See you next time. And please keep safe. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you, Dr. Dan. Thank you both very much. Thank you.